Dear Wet Agus, Cade Mela Falcha, God be to you and a hundred thousand welcomes to you. On behalf of Father John Murphy, Division 9 of the Ancient Order of Liburnians, the Town of Situate, and the Situate Easter Rising Committee, thank you all for being here today. Uh, this has been a long time coming, and just for those of you who don't know, I will share with you a little bit of the history. In Easter of 2016, a number of Hibernians from the Father John Murphy Division were fortunate enough to be in Dub Dublin for the centenary of the Easter Rising. And when they returned, the idea uh, was, was mentioned about giving a donation of a, uh, a framed copy of the Easter Proclamation to the town of Situate. And we reached out to the Situate Select Board, specifically uh, John Danahy, and he was in support of that, but then he talked about the idea and he ran it by our division about having an actual commemoration of the Easter Rising. So, around April 24th, 2016, we had a small ceremony here, including a reading of the proclamation. And that's where it all started. And then we picked up from there. The idea was mentioned about having something more permanent by way of a marker. And we went before the select board a number of times, and eventually the town did approve of a granite monument, which you see today. It is rather an extraordinary uh, tribute to the support of the cities and towns around the South Shore of Massachusetts, the State Board, the Father John Murphy Division, and people everywhere who want to honor this very special day in Irish history. Uh, this has been paid for entirely by, part, by private funds, and it really is a unique um, monument to the sacrifices of the people in 1916. It's made of Vermont granite, and we were scheduled to dedicate it in April of 2020, but something got in the way. So here we are <laughs> today. Um, I'd like to introduce Maureen e. Haiti, a native of, native of Lettermore, County Galway, to sing the Irish National Anthem and the American National Anthem. Well, you may remain seated for a little while because when it partakes to the Irish, it gets a little bit longer than the actual verse. John always likes, I like to talk about this particular anthem and the anthem, both anthems today are very significant in the time that we're living in because both anthems, both the Irish anthem and the American, United States of America's anthem, are really about the cause of independence, freedom from your oppressor. And Independence and freedom means democracy, so you can choose who you want to lead you and who you want to follow. So the Irish National Anthem was, uh, the seed was started in 1903 by Pather Kearney as he was starting to write this song in a little, the Swiss cafe in Dublin, which later became Bewley's. And, um, his friend set the music to it, Heaney, and it was written in English. And then from 200 yards away, another friend of theirs translated it to Irish, Liam O'Ryan, a couple of years later. But it is significant because this song was sung in the GPO 1916. It also became a rallying cry cry for the Irish-American uh, devil era. And it was also, uh, has been in debate <laughs> ever since, is it the real anthem or not? But finally, it is the real anthem. <laughs> so if you think about what the words mean, we are sons of fall, we are warriors of fall. And, it's, and the verse I will sing today from the United States the National Anthem of the United States, I hope, will bring together those 
words that I've just said that I've forgotten what I said. <laughs> but this anthem has caused debate up until 2011. And I'm sure Shane will be able to verify that. Um, government, they've always wanted to change the words. They even had competitions for anthems, but all those entries were long forgotten. The old remains solid as it spoke of the truth of a vision of freedom, independence, and democracy. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so much. Um, now, Father Ken Cannon, our, uh, who had been our priest for many years at St. Mary of the Nativity, is now at uh, St. Albert the Great and uh, St. Francis Xavier in Weymouth, the Collaborative. Uh, Father Cannon is going to bless the monument. Dear friends, we gather here to pray for our brothers and sisters who participated in the 1916 Easter Uprising. Remember especially those who laid down their lives for freedom and national sovereignty. With the passing of time, all of them have passed from death to life in company with the Lord Jesus, who died and rose to new life. We pray that God may welcome them among all the saints of heaven. Let us pray. O oh God, by whose mercy the faithful departed find rest, bless this monument as we establish this new memorial commemorating all those who participated in the 1960 Easter Uprising in Dublin, in the hope of gaining freedom and national sovereignty for the Irish people. May all those who gaze upon this monument remember that freedom is not free, 
that was purchased both in this country and in Ireland by the blood of those pursuing God-given rights. May we enjoy this freedom, never forget all those who lay down their life in our behalf and do our part to protect the precious gift of freedom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Um, now I'd like to introduce to you the chair of the Situate Select Board, Karen Connolly. Thank you, John. On behalf of the town of Situate and its Select Board, many of uh, the members are here today, Tony Vignani, Karen Canfield, Maura Curran, and I don't see Andrew Goodrich, but I'm sure he's here in spirit. Um, I'd like to welcome honored guests and all of the citizens of Situate to this very significant dedication. Uh, it is the only monument to the Easter Rising Rebellion in the United States, and it's fitting that it's here because more than half of Situate descends from Irish uh, blood. And so it's very significant too, in as much as uh, the world today is still in the throes of oppression, and I don't need to mention the current news, but. Um, we're very proud and situate of our, our heritage, and we're very proud to have this monument here. And in closing, I will say that if it hadn't been for the hard work of a small number of people led by John Sullivan, it wouldn't be here. So I thank John especially and uh, welcome you all. Thank you, Kevin. Um, for the entire period of time, that we have had a commemoration of the Easter Rising Monument in Situate. The president of the Father John Murphy Division 9 Plymouth, quite a number of whom are here today and have supported this from day one. The president has been John Travers. And uh, John has done a tremendous amount, not just for this particular monument, but also for the Brig St. John, for activities throughout the South Shore and in the Plymouth area. So it's an honor that John is able to speak today John Travers. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a little over the top, John. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, at least it's not raining like it was last year. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome members of my family, uh, friends, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces out here today, and we couldn't be uh, happier. Uh, also, many of uh, my brothers for the uh, Ancient Order of Hibernians, Father John Murphy, Division 9 from Plymouth. And we have uh, lots of uh, Hibernian brothers from around the state, including uh, Vice President Joe McCuska. Where are you, Joe? Raise your hand. Thanks, Joe. Uh, past President William Sullivan. Bill, thank you. And uh, we also have uh, a special guest who took time out of his very busy schedule to uh, fly in from his home in Ohio. and. Uh, spent some time with us yesterday as well as today, and uh, we're very honored to have the national president of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, uh, Danny O'Connell. Uh, I want to uh, extend thanks to uh, four people who really uh, put their heart and soul into this uh, event every year. Uh, Siobhan Hunter, a long time uh, Situate resident, and uh, my brother Mike Schilling from the Hibernians. Mike, where are you? Mike and Siobhan uh, combined their efforts to uh, put out that great program you have in your hands, along with the help from uh, Brenda O'Connor, who's Brenda, and uh, my good friend John Sullivan. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Easter Rising in 1916 was not the only rising. Uh, through, the, through the last seven or eight hundred years. There were some that were well documented and some not so well documented. Uh, but the Father John Murphy Division takes its name from a priest who helped in the rising of 1798 and uh, he was captured by the, uh, the Brits and he wasn't treated too kindly. But we took his name 
in our division to honor his memory. Uh, last year, I uh, held up this book. It's called The Immortal Irishman. It's about an Irish revolutionary who became an American hero. And uh, he was quite a character. His name is Thomas Francis Marr. Uh, he was spared the death penalty by the British and sent to a penal colony in Tasmania. He uh, never made it back to his beloved island, but he did come to the United States and made quite a name for himself, but I will uh, not let you in on that. But the, the book is a great read. But when I first picked up this book about four years ago, I had a terrible time getting through the very first few paragraphs of the very first chapter of the book. And at times it, uh, it made me quite angry, at times it made me sad, but most often than not now it makes me very proud, proud of my Irish her her heritage, excuse me, my ancestry, and proud of the resiliency of the Irish people who stood steadfast for over 700 years uh, with a brutal, oppressive, occupying nation. So I'd like to share the, this again this year. And the, the first chapter in this book is very appropriately titled, Under the Boot Heel. For the better part of seven centuries, to be Irish in Ireland was to live in a land not your own. You called the lake next to your family home by one name, and the occupiers gave it another. You knew a town had been built by the hands of your ancestors, the quarry of origin for the stones pressed into those streets, and you were forbidden from inhabiting it. You could not enter a court of law as anything but a criminal or a snitch. You could not worship your God in a church open to the public without risking prison or public flogging. You could not attend school at any level, even at home. And if your parents sent you out of the country to be educated, you could not return. You could not marry, conduct trade, or go into business with a Christian Protestant. You could not have a foster child. If orphaned, you were forced into a home full of people who rejected your faith. You could not play your favorite sports. Hurling was specifically prohibited. You could not own land in more than 80% of your own country. The bogs, the barrens, and the highlands were your haunts. You could not own a horse worth more than five pounds sterling. If you married an Englishman, you would lose everything upon his death. You could not speak your language outside your home. You would not think in Irish, Irish so the logic went, if you were not allowed to speak in Irish. Your ancient verses were forbidden from being uttered in select company. Your songs could not be sung. Your music not played. Your Celtic crosses not displayed. You could be thrown into prison for expressions of your folklore or native art. One law made it a felony for a piper, a storyteller, a babbler, or a rhymer to be in the company of an Englishman. Another six statute banished bards and minstrels. You could not vote. You could not hold it. Excuse me. You could not hold office. You were nothing. The law does not suppose any such person to exist as an Irish Roman Catholic, said John Bowes, an 18th century Lord Chancellor of the Ireland. Nor can any such person draw a breath without the Crown's permission. Excuse me. The melodies of this nation and its favorite instrument were a particular target of English hatred. At one point, your fingernails could be removed if you were caught playing the harp. The Irish married to the sounds that came from that instrument, and they grieved in some of those same keys. But the indigenous music came to be seen as suburban, subversive, excuse me, too nationalistic, too connected to the old stories. In 1603, it was proclaimed that all manners of bards and harpers were to be exterminated by martial law. The same year, a few months before her death, it was said in Ireland that Queen Elizabeth had ordered her troops to hang the harpers wherever they were found and destroy their instruments. The Virgin Queen allowed Shakespeare and Marlowe to reach great heights during her long reign, but Elizabeth had not a thimble of tolerance for a people she considered primitive. To encourage the elimination of one musical aspect of that culture, the government paid a bounty to anyone who turned in outlaws of the harp. The musicians were easy to round up, Many of them were blind. Music, their only refuge and source of income. 
What had the Irish done to deserve these cruelties? They had simply refused to become English. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, John. Um, I know uh, quite a few of you have the programs, and we're going to uh, take uh, Senator O'Connor out of order because he has another event to attend to. But uh, before um, he speaks, I just wanted to acknowledge that every single year that we have had this commemoration, no matter what, Senator Patrick O'Connor has been a part of it. So, oh, okay. Senator. Yay. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Again, I apologize that I'm going to have to take off. We have a, the opening of our Little League in Weymouth today, so uh, it's a big parade that they do. Uh, but I really wanted to be here today for this dedication. Uh, it shows a lot uh, of the town of Situate uh, to have this dedication every single year to Brenda, Siobhan, John, everybody that puts this on. Every single year that I've been here, I've seen this, uh, this celebration continue to grow. And I'm, gr I'm really happy to see that because now, especially with uh, what we have going on in Eastern Europe, uh, the struggle for independence, for freedom, for democracy, to be able to, to live in a society that you can choose your own destiny uh, is even more important now than it has ever been. Uh, and I'd say in any of these celebrations that we've had in the past few years, given the current geopolitical climate. Uh, but what those 16 individuals did in 1916 was incredible uh, and really started the process of having a freer Ireland and being able to put that foundation in place and that other individuals could then build upon that and know that uh, courage and perseverance and trials and tribulations and all the challenges that Ireland faced in order to get to where they are today uh, was possible. And so to be able to commemorate that, I think is incredibly important. So thank you to the town of Situate and to everybody that put this, puts us on every single year, to the Hibernians and to everyone here that's, uh, that's celebrating and marking a, a tragedy that led to a democracy. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, our next speaker is the uh, chair of the Situate West Cork Sister City Committee, uh, Siobhan Hunter. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, John. Uh, we have quite a few tremendous speakers here today, so I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today, including our guests that have traveled so far, uh, that, and thanks for taking the time um, for this long-awaited official dedication. For those that do not know me, along with the, being on the board of the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail and on the Easter Rising Monument Committee, I am the chair of the Situate West Cork Sister City Committee. Say that 10 times fast, and I've had to a lot, so. <laughs> the town of Situate Twins with West Cork in 2016 and our committee was appointed in 2017. Our main mission is to acknowledge and preserve the contributions of Irish immigrants and their descendants here in Situate in the U.S. Another ongoing mission is to create and maintain a relationship with West Cork community that includes the exchange of ideas and, of, and people, as well as enriching and deepening our connection. From the onset, our committee's amazing collaboration and immense passion for all things Irish couldn't be stronger. Despite many of us working full-time jobs, having families to care for and manage, being part of multiple other committees, and whatever else life throws at us, the feats that we have accomplished together have been considerable. I want to take the time to thank all of our committee members, past and present, for their tremendous effort, dedication, hard work, and overwhelming passion. I'd also like to thank our community, the town of Situate, Jim Lorraine, Michelle, and Seth too, <laughs> friends and family for our continued support over the years. Having grown up first generation Irish, community has always been so important. It truly takes a village, and I'm so happy to call Situate mine. There's more, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Told you, brief, right? <laughs> As we take the time to commemorate the events of the Easter Rising that took place 106 years ago today, we remember the lives lost, the, on, the agonizing history that led up to that point, and the struggles of generations before and afterwards. It also reminds us to be thankful for how far we have come. However, perpetual strides to make progress are still necessary. 
here in Ireland and around the world. The egregious Russian invasion of Ukraine strikes a chord in the heart of people worldwide, and pe perhaps even more with the Irish, that still must defend the Good Friday Agreement. And as Americans having won our independence 200 plus years ago. With that, although our Constitution grants us God forgiven right or God given rights to freedom of speech and freedom of religion, it seems not, not until recently have people truly felt free to celebrate their culture, Irish or otherwise. To this day, many descendants of immigrants frown upon today's immigrants who are equal contributors to our society. Much of, I, much of Irish immigration can be directly or indirectly attributed to foreign occupation, forcing them to flee to the U.S. and other countries, welcome or not. People forget that there, have been, there has been, never been a need for mass exodus in the U.S. to date. Perhaps those are the same people who forget who built this country whilst leaving the Native American culture to perish. With that, I'm a strong believer in never being ashamed of who you are or where you came from. Instead, let that be your motivation to simply make a difference, to move forward, make life better for yourself and others. So to all, take the time to remember where you came from, remember what people have done, excuse me, remember what others have done for, I've lost my place. <laughs> it's cold up here. <laughs> remember where you came from. Remember what people have done for you and others. And remember to make a difference in any way you can. No matter the size of the, no matter the size, we are truly are a village. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, our next speaker is State Rep Representative Joan Moschino. Joan has also been a regular and consistent participation in the commemorations held annually here around the 24th of April. Joan. Thank you so much, John. And um, I just uh, wanted to come and uh, bring, on behalf of myself and my colleague, Patrick Kearney, I just wanted to come and bring greetings from Beacon Hill. It has just been my absolute delight and pleasure to be included in your celebration year after year, and I'm just so deeply honored to be here today as you do the dedication, the formal dedication and the blessing. Uh, I just think that this stands for hope at a special moment in time when the Irish community always sticks together to celebrate culture and language and family and freedom and, and voice and independence. Today, more than any, I think it is so important that you stand together as a community and, and speak in the, in the face of global events. I did also just want to make sure everyone noticed that we have another special guest with us. The Honorable Jim Cantwell is here with us. Uh, we always love having Jim with us as a favorite Southern situate, uh, even though today he's here representing Senator Markey's office, and he also, the Senator, sends his warm blessings of, um, of peace and independence to all of you as well. It is cold up here, even though the sun is starting to shine and it's not raining, so I will be very brief and just say thank you again. Greetings from Beacon Hill, and really just in stand strong and do what you do as, as an Irish community and show the world what it really means to have, to celebrate family and culture, language, voice, and independence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is the president of the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail, which four weeks from this very day is having its official launch. But uh, I'll have Brenda speak about that in greater detail. Brenda O'Connor. Isn't this a wonderful day? Yeah. Uh, and this is okay. this is a wonderful day, and I have to uh, commend John Sullivan for his persistence, his dedication, and his really one man effort to make this come true. And it has. Congratulations. To
often when I'm in the harbor, I see people looking at the monument, and what makes me very, very proud is they read it. They read every word, and then they go around the back to read it. And that is another area of which I'm very proud. This uh, monument is dedicated to all those who struggle and fight for freedom, even to this day. So it is very fitting that we think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are now doing what the Irish did for 800 years, struggling for their freedom. I've been asked, and it is my pleasure, to introduce you to the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail. Inspired by the Wild Atlantic Trail in Ireland and our own Boston Irish Heritage Trail, the Situate West Cork Committee uh, envisioned the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail to celebrate the Irish and Irish American contributions to the South Shore of Boston, the most Irish area in the United States. Encouraged by grant money from the Government of Ireland, Immigrant Support Program, and the support of the Office of the Consul General of Ireland in Boston, nine towns were invited to become part of the trail. In traveling the trail from Weymouth to Plymouth, you will see places where Irish immigrants lived, worked, and built new lives in a country far distant from their homeland. There are monuments to the tragedies that marked their escape from famine and disease, evidence of the industries they built to sustain their lives, and the seaside places where they found entertainment and relief from the heat of the city. To follow the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail is to walk in the footsteps of one of the many ethnic groups that helped build America. Learn more about the trail at our website ssirishtrail.org. And now we are ready to launch that trail. The formal launch ceremony will be on May 22nd, right here at the bandstand on Cole Parkway, and we invite you to join us. That will be at 1 o'clock. And we will say, Falsha, welcome. Come celebrate. Celebrate Irish heritage. Celebrate a bit of Irish history in America. Celebrate heroes, rebels, soldiers, mossers, shopkeepers, and more. Come visit us, learn with us, sing with us, eat with us, stay with us. Come drive the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail and celebrate. It is now my pleasure to introduce the national president of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, uh, Danny O'Connell. He has traveled out here from Ohio, as, president, as my brother, pre uh, President uh, John Travers mentioned. And Danny, from the get-go, was very, very interested and supportive of this. But in particular, uh, he's had the chance to, to uh, visit the town of Situate and the town of Cohasset yesterday. But uh, the fact that we've had so many Hibernians here in support of this, and the fact that the national president took the time to be here for this dedication is extremely significant. So it's a great honor to introduce President Danny O'Connell. People often ask, what's Irish America look like? Well, look around the parking lot. <laughs> this is Irish America. I'm honored to be part of this commemoration and this dedication representing the ancient order of Hibernians in America. I want to thank our local president, John Travers, and John Sullivan for the kind invite. It wasn't until I arrived yesterday and met the brother Hibernians that I realized it was optional. I, John, John's very forceful on the phone. He didn't ask me if I was coming. He just asked me what time I'd get here. I told him I could take a flight and get in at 1 in the afternoon, and he said, well, you know there's a flight that'll get you here at 9. <laughs> so I arrived here yesterday at 9 a.m., and I had a history lesson. 
And my only request was I wasn't tested today. <laughs> and he gave me so much information, and his friends gave me so much information about this area of the United States, a beautiful area that I've never been to before. I've been in Massachusetts many a times, but never in situated. I'm so glad I had this opportunity. Last night I had that reoccurring dream that so many of us have, that we're in college, we're gonna have an exam and we're not ready for it. And I was thinking, did I remember everything John told me? I thought it was gonna be tested this morning. But on May 4th, 1836, the Ancient Order of America was founded to protect the lives of our Irish Catholic clergy, to aid and protect our fellow immigrants from Ireland, and to work for an Ireland free from British control, <coughs> tyranny, dating back to 1169. Think about that. How long they were controlled by a foreign country. That's hard to believe. Today, we meet to commemorate the 1916 Eastern Proclamation issued by the vol Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army during the Easter Rising on the 24th of April, 106 years ago today. I was blessed, with, like so many of you, to be in Dublin for the centenary in 2016. And I'll never forget listening to the soldier, the Irish soldier, read the proclamation. And it took you back to 1916. And it's still so hard to believe what those men did and those women did to create what we now know as the Republic of Ireland. Shortly, we're going to hear the Eastern Proclamation recited. I ask everybody to listen closely. We're all going to hear it. But listen closely as the words that, are, that are, you're, we're going to hear are very significant even today. We could sit here and discuss a proclamation of the Rep Irish Republic for hours, but I just want to focus on a few lines from this tremendous vision that was put forth to us today, 106 years ago today, that are still so impactful today. The very first line to the people of Ireland, Irish men and Irish women. What do you see? A proclamation of a new country where all people are equal. What a progressive vision that was in 1916 for the world. Again, in paragraph four, the Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irishman and every Irish woman. How progressive. Calling us all to be together as one people. No wonder Irish America is as strong as it is today, coming from the an our ancestors being that powerful and that forward thinking. Ireland is the only country I know of that was founded on the principles of equal rights for all people. How, pride, how proud Irish Americans are of this fact. Then you look at paragraph two. Supported by her exiled children of America. That is our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, who when they came here, long before 1836, we could go all the way back to, to the revolution when Commodore John Barry from County Wexford became the first flagship officer of the United States Navy. How important it was for what these people did and what we all do to give back to Ireland that in the proclamation they say, supported by her exiled children in America. What this line did created Irish America that we know today. This simple line really initiated the coveted shamrock ceremony handled, 
an, that goes on annually on St. Patrick's Day when the leaders of Ireland have the opportunity to meet with the President of the United States. Regardless of who's in charge, what parties in the office, once the ceremony started, it'll never stop. Ireland is guaranteed a face-to-face -face meeting with the President of the United States because of each and every one of you, Irish America. We are all part of this when it happens. We are all Irish America. Unfortunately, still today, 106 years later, we must continue the battles now for a free and united Ireland as the Irish people continue to fight injustices imposed by the British government in North Ireland. Many of us remember the Good Friday Agreement and say, well, wasn't that all fixed? If you go back to World War II, you take 25, 25 years after Armistice Day, and you look and you see Germany and you see Japan and you see their role in the world. As we come to 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement, we look to the North Ireland as if that agreement was just implemented months ago. So many, so many parts of that have been left undone. Today, the support of Irish America invoked in the proclamation of the Republic of Ireland continues. Our next speaker, Congressman Bill Keating, demonstrated that Irish America will no longer stand for the British injustices in the north of Ireland when he, working with the Father John Murphy Division of the Ancient Order Hibernians and other local AOH divisions, created House Resolution 888. House Resolution 888. A lot of us know it, a lot of us don't. But this was a resolution calling on the British government to stop their amnesty proposals that would end the possibility of prosecutions of war crimes committed in the north of Ireland that date back more than 50 years, such as Bloody Sunday. Can you imagine events like that in America and 50 years later, we're just getting the initial hearings. Congressman Keating demonstrated that American support today for Ireland is bipartisan. Together, we obtained 50 co-sponsors for a resolution, both Democratic and Republican representatives lined up. I'm not sure if there's another resolution out there at the time of this one that had 50 co-sponsors bipartisan. We had Democratic, we had Republican, we had some of the most conservative members of Congress, we had some of the most liberals members of Congress sign on to co-sponsor this bill. Thank you Irish America for getting that done. That feat alone is just remarkable. 50 bipartisan co-sponsors. Then, on St. Patrick's Day, Congressman Keating brought the, this bill forward for a vote. It was unanimous. So it passed unanimous. What a statement that was for the British government. Well done, Mr. Keating. He led Irish America delivering a me message to the British government, telling them that the words of the proclamation of Ireland stand true today. Ireland is and always will be supported by her exiled ch children in America. And we will keep working, and thanks to leaders such as the congressman here, we will all, I believe, have the opportunity to see a free and united Ireland. The Ireland that all of our parents, our grandparents, and generations of our families wanted to see. But it takes each and every one of you, each member of our Irish American family, to keep it in the news. And we need to keep working together. I thank you for coming out today. I thank for, again for the invite. What a wonderful place. And I couldn't think anywhere else I'd rather be today. 
We've got 51 Hibernians right now in Ireland on a fact-finding mission, but I'm, I'm happier because I'm here today to be part of this. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, President O'Connell. Uh, we are also fortunate today to have with us uh, Congressman Keating, his wife, Tevis, and his right-hand man in the Plymouth office, Mike Jackman. Um, by way of background, on March 5th, 1770, five unarmed civilians were shot and killed by British troops in what's now known as the Boston Massacre. Within one week's time, all of those soldiers had been charged and arraigned. By November of 1770, the trial was over and done. Some were acquitted, some were convicted. On January 30th, 1972, 26 unarmed men and women were shot by British troops. Fort in Derry in Ireland. 14 of them died. Six were 17 year old boys. Not one British soldier has been brought to account to this day. On the coming up on the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, January 30th, 2022, Congressman Keating put together Resolution 888 because he saw that the British government, through Boris Johnson, was seeking amnesty for those soldiers. And through his hard work, he was able to put a stop to that in far, as far as getting the resolution drafted, the support, and passed, as President O'Connell referenced. So I'm proud that we're honored today for our once and future Congressman, Bill Keating. Thank you, John, uh, and thank you, uh, Dan uh, and John, for your work uh, helping uh, organize and, and getting that bipartisan resolution through. Uh, I was at uh, the St. Patrick's luncheon with the Taoiseach, and uh, all of a sudden, it appeared very rude. I had to get up uh, and excuse myself right in the midst of lunch because the bill was on the floor, so how was that for timing? Uh, with him here... Uh, and uh, the English uh, representatives here, uh, we were dating, uh, debating that right on the floor at that moment. So thank you for everything you've done. You've really uh, been a strong voice uh, for justice, and that's what that is about. Uh, it's Irish justice, but it's justice for all. Uh, it's great to be here as well. Uh, Father Cannon with my colleagues in uh, Massachusetts government, Patrick uh, Left, and Joan is... Uh, well, she was here too, and uh, ex-colleagues, uh, Jimmy Cantwell. There she is, all right. And, uh, and Jimmy is here as always, uh, thank you. Uh, as well as uh, local officials, uh, and, and, and Karen Conley and, and the whole board that's here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. You know, as I look out at this beautiful monument, uh, it's really unique, because there aren't that many monuments in the United States commemorating something that occurred in another country uh, such as this is. And if you look at it, it makes some sense uh, clearly on the surface because this is situate and it's well known to be the most Irish American uh, community in the United States. And it looks out at a harbor where we can look at uh, and think about uh, so many of our relatives, my own included, uh, that came over uh, across the ocean seeking safe harbor uh, in the United States from the oppression, the famine, uh, the discrimination that they faced uh, at home. So the thoughtfulness of this whole uh, setting as well as the monument itself is extraordinary and I want to thank the committee for all their hard work. It isn't easy. Something like that. And these monuments are here, uh, you know, not just as something to commemorate just an event, it's to honor people as well, and honor courage, usually, and the courage uh, that the people that 
lost their lives uh, in the Easter Rising should re be remembered. And then the courage as they faced justice of the 16 that were executed or the, or the 2,600 that were wounded uh, facing enormous odds with the, the greatest military in its time on the face of the earth and a few of them standing up, realizing the numbers, realizing the effect, and speaking up for their own independence and freedom. But monuments are here to do more than just honor individuals. They're here to educate people, to tell a story, to preserve a lesson that can be passed on from generation to generation, and they're there to inspire as well. And I look at the people that led this, people like uh, John Connolly uh, or Tom, Tom Clark or uh, Patrick Pierce, and you look at those individuals that had the courage to organize in the face of such odds. And, and Pierce uh, was an interesting person as well, because he was doing much more before this. He was a poet. He was an educator. He worked hard to make sure that the Irish language and the Irish culture was not stamped down by the British, which they were trying to do, because to defeat or have subjugate a population, you often have to take away their own culture, their own language. And he was a fierce battler to preserve that language and education. And so much of Irish history is passed down gener generation to generation. And my own grandmother, uh, I remember, and she left uh, for the U.S. just a short time before uh, the rising. And she came here, uh, met uh, my grandfather, who has just uh, lived a few miles away, as it turned out, in Ireland, and they married here and brought up a, a family. Uh, and for hours, when I was a young, young guy and loved my grandmother, uh, she could recite hours after hours of poetry, Irish poetry. Uh, and it, I, I thought it was so extraordinary, and what a keen mind she had. But that was the way this is being preserved, generation to generation. And there were two themes. I don't remember all of the words, but there were two themes. One of them themes was usually the beauty of Ireland and the sea and communities and talking about Dingle or wherever you want to, seaports. And the others were very different. They were about the British. They were about the oppression. They were about the battles and the violence that were occurring on. And that's the poetry uh, that my grandmother would say to me because that's the way they preserved what was going on there and passed it on. And as you look at the lessons that are here and the education that's there passing that forward, I'm reminded of the discrimination that, uh, John, that was a wonderful example of all the discrimination that occurred uh, to the people of Ireland at that time. And she also taught me another lesson. As they brought a family forth here in the U.S. in their town, uh, they couldn't own their house at that time, but they saved and scrimped. She was a, came here uh, as a house servant. My grandfather was a uh, field hand. Uh, they worked and scrimped and had eight children and brought it up. And finally, they had a chance to buy a home. And as the, they were going to buy that home from the person they rented from, the neighborhood, which was quite Protestant Yankee at the time, thought it would be the end of the neighborhood if an Irish Catholic purchased a home uh, on their street. Uh, and so one of the neighbors got on the phone and started getting all the neighbors up. And the woman kept saying, this will be the end of our neighborhood. Our house prices will go down. Uh, we'll never withstand this terrible thing of having someone from Ireland uh, but actually buy a house in our neighborhood. Uh, fortunately, she was not successful. But the lesson that my grandmother taught me as a young child went beyond that. Because you see, further down in that street, not too many years later, uh, there was a bunch of Jewish people that wanted to purchase land for their own temple on that same street. And sure enough, the same woman uh, got on the telephone and started calling all the neighbors. And this time she called my grandmother. <laughs> not a good move. And my grandmother, still with her brother, said to her, said, 
Now this wouldn't be the same type of meeting you were having about me, would it be? <laughs> but she told me further. She went, and this is very uncharacteristic at that time, but she went to the local town meeting and stood up for that transfer of the land. And she taught me as a young child that we have to fight for discrimination. And with her background and our shared background and heritage, we know that. Uh, and we understand that. So we look at those, that monument, we learn those lessons, and hopefully we can pass it down to generations to come. Uh, I know we've had hearings, and I'm chair of the committee uh, on Europe that deals with uh, Ireland and Irish issues, and we have had many, and thank you for those kind words. Uh, and just in that same spirit, next week in the committee I chair, we are going to have another hearing uh, dealing with some of the difficulties that it still exist, whether they're the legacy issues, whether they're protocol issues, which are really quite uh, paramount right now because uh, elections are occurring in uh, Northern Ireland and Sinn Féin is, I think, got an eight point lead uh, on those elections. And there's a real concern that once again, if the first minister changes, they'll just pull back and dissolve government again. And we can't let that happen if we're gonna have progress. And we can't let those legacy issues and justice for those accountable uh, not be uh, swept under the carpet for another generation. So we fight for these issues. Next week, we're going to bring in young people uh, from Ireland, north and south. And we are going to bring them together. And we're going to talk about how this new generation can bring peace forward, uh, peace in the, and solidarity uh, in Ireland as a whole. And so again, the lessons of education and inspiration occur. So I want to thank you for all that you've done to send these important messages forward. And I want to make sure that uh, as we look at something that on the surface appears very unique, that we're here honoring an event that happened in another country here in the United States. But the more you think of it, there couldn't be a monument that's more American in its theme, standing up for freedom against discrimination for a person's ability uh, to move forward in life than that monument right there. So congratulations uh, on something so important. I have, I won't do it because it's cold, but I have citations uh, in recognition of this from Congress and perhaps we can get some pictures when we do that later, but it's for uh, the ancient uh, uh, order of Hibernians, it's for uh, the Tana Situate and it's for, um, itself. So thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman. Um, before we read the proclamation, I also wanted to uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, Jim Cantwell was present here for the very first commemoration and uh, he's been supportive from day one. Jim, thank you. Uh, also, um, I wanted to acknowledge Seth Pfeiffer behind the camera. <laughs> Seth does great work for the town of Situate. He's been out rain or shine, and it's been more rain than shine, but Seth has been there no matter what. So Seth, thank you. And then um, on the podium, uh, excuse me, on the stage with us is also um, a, a treasure, our resident historian and a woman whose encyclopedic knowledge of Ireland goes back decades, Professor Catherine Shannon. In the, uh, in the brochure, there's the, the great line from, from Connolly to Pierce. After <clears throat> this proclamation had been read, the, uh, in, on April 24, 1916, the, the rebels started at Liberty Hall, and they marched uh, all the way to the GPO, the General Post Office in Dublin, except uh, for Tom Clark, who was held prison for 15 years in England, <clears throat> under an assumed name, by the way. He, he gave the name of Henry Wilson, his, but they didn't know his real name, Henry Wilson. 
and he he was in he rode in a car as did um, Joseph Mary Plunkett who had essentially just gotten out of the hospital and shouldn't have even been there that day but after they took over the GPO Pierce stood outside the GPO and read the proclamation for the first time and that's when Connolly said to Pierce thanks be to God Pierce I live to see this day so this is the proclamation that was 700 years in the making public Neheran the provisional government of the Irish Republic to the people of Ireland Irish men and Irish women in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood Ireland through us summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom having organized and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organization the Irish Republican Brotherhood and through her open military organization the Irish volunteers and the Irish citizen army having patiently perfected her discipline having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself she now seizes that moment and supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe but relying in the first on her own strength she strikes in full confidence of victory we declare the right of the people of Ireland to ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible the long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right nor can it ever be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people in every generation the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty six times during the last 300 years they have asserted it in arms standing on that fundamental right and again asserting it in arms in the face of the world we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign independent state and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom of its welfare and of its exaltation among the nations the Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman the Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all its parts cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious to the difference of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government which have divided a minority from the majority in the past until our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of a permanent national government representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected by the suffrages of all her men and women the provisional government hereby constituted will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic in trust for the people we place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of Most High God whose blessing we evo invoke upon our arms and we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonor it by cowardice inhumanity or rapine in this supreme hour the Irish nation must by its valor and discipline and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called signed on behalf of the provisional government Thomas J Clark Sean McDermott PH Pierce James Connolly Thomas McDonough Eamon Kent Joseph Plunkett
and for, uh, for those of you with programs, I know you, we were intending to have, and I know Leisha Moore, Consul General Leisha Moore was intending to be here, but unfortunately her husband just tested positive for COVID. So with, through an abundance of caution, uh, she has asked, and Vice Consul General uh, Shane Caffrey has uh, volunteered to step forward and be the keynote speaker. So we are honored to have him with us today to talk about this pivotal date in Irish history at the dedication of the monument. Consul General. Thank you very much, everybody. And I know Alicia's very sorry that she can't join us today, but you'll just have to deal with me instead. So <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> so I'm going to a carja, the Luker Erm of Ben Show, Egan Kriush Basilta Show in you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, friends, I'm delighted to be here at this special gathering today. I'm truly honoured to be here at the annual commemoration in situate of the 1916 Easter Rising and on the special occasion of the dedication of the Situate Easter Rising Monument. I know many people here put a lot of time and a lot of effort into this, and I want to extend my congratulations to you all. As well as standing as a reminder of that pivotal day in Irish history over 100 years ago, to me, the monument represents the very special and strong bonds between Ireland and Situate and the South Shore. Having been here several times, I know that the links go back generations, but they are also contemporary, because so many people and so many groups here work to ensure that those bonds with Ireland stay strong. From the Situate Easter Rising uh, Monument Committee, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the Situate West Cork Sister Committee, the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail, to our elected representatives joining us here today. There's a newly created Irish American Caucus in the Massachusetts State House, and there's the influential Friends of Ireland of, in Congress. I'd like to, I'd like in particular to recognise Congressman Bill Keating for his tireless efforts as a member of the Friends of Ireland, especially his work, as was discussed earlier on today, to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement and peace and prosperity on the island of Ireland are protected from the effects of Brexit. I'd also like to recognise his important work in ensuring that there can be no unilateral amnesty introduced for the troubles related deaths in Northern Ireland and that those responsible for violence are held accountable. Ladies and gentlemen, the links between our two countries are historic but they remain important today. American support was key to the realisation of the Irish independence. More recently, the people and politicians of this part of the United States played an especially important role in the peace process. People like Senator Ted Kennedy, Speaker Tip O'Neill and Senator George Mitchell who chaired the talks leading to the Good Friday Agreement. Good timing. <laughs> we'll play on anyway. Perseverance, you know. <laughs> and today, the efforts of the people, uh, people like Representative Bill Keating and the other Friends of Ireland, including the many of the Massachusetts Congressional Delegation, remain crucial. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Irish state, but it also um, marks the 50th anniversary of Irish membership of the European Union. There we go. <laughs> and, as we, and as we look next year to the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, I want to pay tribute to all of you and to your efforts to ensure that the bonds between Ireland and this part of America re remain particularly strong. This monument was conceived as the, uh, um, was conceived as the people of Situate commemorated the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Rising. It is always striking to me that the text of the proclamation explicitly references America. Our links stretch back before 1916, of course, to the Great Famine and beyond. The proclamation also references Europe, and I want to take a moment to reflect on the events in Europe as we witness the heartbreaking, horrifying scenes in the war, uh, of the war in Ukraine. Like you, like you in the United States, we in Ireland stand firmly with the people of Ukraine. As people here will know uh, better than most, Ireland's history has witnessed many of our own people fleeing their own, our own country in desperation. Those people found refuge abroad, not least here in the United States and here in Situate. So it is right that we in Ireland help others fleeing desperate circumstances when we are in a position to do so. Like our fellow uh, EU member states, we have opened our doors to those fleeing the conflict. We have waived visa requirements for Ukrainians and our government will ensure that those arriving will have temporary protected status that provides them with a place to stay, healthcare, child supports, income supports and a right to work in Ireland. When our Minister for Education visited Massachusetts on for St. Patrick's Day, she spoke about the many Ukrainian children who have already started school in Ireland. Thousands of Ukrainians have arrived in Ireland already, and there's no cap on numbers, which could unfortunately reach hundreds of thousands as desperate people flee the conflict. We in Ireland know the value of solidarity, 
Our own history has witnessed our people fleeing their country in desperation in great numbers. These people found refuge and support abroad, not least in this country. Connection and community are themes that resonate strongly through Ireland's history. This year marks the centenary of the establishment of our state, and we recall both the connections with our diaspora and the solidarity of friends overseas who supported Ireland as it sought to assert its right to stop self-determination and to chart its own history as a nation. It is right that we show the same solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Ireland is lucky to have friends throughout the world, but nowhere I would venture to say are those, uh, those bonds of friendship stronger than here in this most Irish part of America. And I love to tell this to my colleagues in Chicago, in New York, in Florida, <laughs> everywhere. It's like, no, no, Citroën wins every time. <laughs> so I want to pay tribute to all of you for your friendship, your community, and your connection with Ireland. Thank you for your work in raising this wonderful monument, for all you do, and for all that you do to ensure that the links between Ireland and Citroën remain strong. Thank you for inviting me to be here on this very special occasion. So, Gur Mag of Galer, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shay. Um, uh, before we conclude, uh, Maureeny Haiti would like to sing a beautiful song that really strengthens and talks about the, the bonds and the ties between Ireland and America. Maureen? It's called A Dear Little Isle, and instead of the ten verses, there's only two. <laughs> <laughs> Something akin to your grandmother's poetry. There's a dear little isle in the western ocean, an island of beauty so holy and grand that its name fills her sons and her daughters in a Exile. Oh, a love they have known for that dear little land. It's Ireland, our country, the birthplace of heroes, the land of the warriors, scholars and saints, of bards and of chieftains, whose name live in stories. Oh, may you live on forever on our history's page. For we love every blade of grass green on your mountains, every leaf on your trees, every rock on your strands. Oh, we love your green hills and your murmuring fountains. Oh, we love you, Akhushle, our own dear native land. You who once were a proud and a prosperous nation, with your name and your fame renowned all over the world. Till misfortune came o'er you and saw the desolation and your emerald banner in their slavery lay unfurled. As they tortured your children, destroyed your green bowers, they tried to exterminate us a long time ago. But we are the Irish, we're like wild creeping flowers. Oh, the faster you pluck us, the quicker 
we seem to grow for we love every blade of grass green on your mountains every leaf on your tree every rock on your strand and we love your green hills and those murmuring fountains oh we love you Akhushla, the place of our birth Karamina Mahake Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you all for coming out. Um, you are all invited to the Situate Yacht Club. We are having a reception. We'll have some refreshments. We're going to have some live Irish music. It is on Jericho Road, um, and you are all welcome to attend. Thank you for coming out. And uh, Brother Paul Boyle on the bagpipes. Thank you.